All right, good morning, Hillside. Did I scare you? Yeah. yeah, all right. Well, good. Maybe I'm waking you up. So we're glad you're here this morning. Uh, and you are here probably because you thought, well, Wayne, it's Sunday and I come to church on Sundays or somebody invited me or somebody forced me in the car. However you got here this morning, here's the wild thing. The creator of the universe, the maker of all things, brought you here this morning. He called you here this morning by his spirit, whether you knew it or not, because he first is calling you and me into a close, personal, real, meaningful relationship with himself. And when he brings you into relationship with himself, he brings you into relationship with everybody else who's in a connection with him as well. So that's why we're here. And uh, God gathers us together. He calls us together to dig into his word together because that's a way that we connect with him. And to worship together, that's a way that we draw close to him. And to pray together. So let's do that. Let's stand and we're going to pray to our living God together. We're going to talk to him. Living God, we thank you for your presence here already, God. We thank you for that work that you planned in each of us before the creation of the world and that you are rolling out in our lives today. We thank you for what you have for us today, God. We are a people who get hungry and thirsty pretty quickly, Lord, so we ask that you would fill us with your love, with your life, with your power, with your spirit, Lord. We need you. Uh, we thank you for uh, what you're going to do Amen. There's joy in the house of the 
Wow, what joy. Um, please uh, have a seat, and as you do, if you just kind of scoot to the middle, if there's a chair next to you, we want to save room for... All right. Hey, there's more of you than when I last was up here. Look at that. Yeah, uh, it could get crowded in here, so just be mindful. If somebody's looking for a seat, just scooch in. Thanks for doing that. And uh, kids, K through fifth grade, it is your time to go down to your classrooms. Uh, you can follow Pete or Carly down. Thank you, teachers and helpers. Right on. And our students are staying with us here today. And uh, we're going to have a slightly different order of service today, so just be prepared. I know, it's crazy. I know. Let me make sure you have a bulletin, though. That's very important, because we want you to be able to follow along closely with what's happening. So if you don't have a bulletin, raise your hand, and some ushers will come by and give you one of these, these bad boys. And uh, you're going to be able to see what's uh, happening at Hillside. There's a lot of great things. And uh, we're going to give you a few highlights here real quick. Uh, we're going to start by looking back. Back to last Saturday, we had a great event called Freedom Walk. Uh, raises awareness about this uh, terrible problem of human trafficking in the Bay Area, Bay Area and in the world. Uh, not only did they raise awareness uh, about this problem, but they also raised support to help survivors uh, get some housing and take some next steps in their lives. Over 300 people registered for this. There were 19 churches involved, including Hillside, uh, including six Hillsiders. Uh, Nice job. Yes. And if you're interested in getting involved in that project, you can contact the anti-human trafficking team here at Hillside. Go to the serve page and you'll see Jenny LaSalle's contact information. Or just raise your hand, Jenny. Go see her. All right. Yes. Um, I also want to tell you about uh, something happening today after service at 1130 a.m., uh, we are having an informational meeting for a trip we're taking to the Dominican Republic to see some of our ministry partners there. Uh, it's a great opportunity for you to go to another part of the world and see what God is doing there. Uh, come alongside, encourage uh, our brothers and sisters there. And uh, if you're curious about that, or if you already know you're going on this trip, go to the informational meeting today. Uh, 11.30 a.m., go downstairs, go all the way to the end of the building by the elevator. There's classroom two. That's where you're going to meet. Uh, and either way, if you're going to that or if you can't go, get an information sheet on the welcome counter, and there's going to be applications due for that trip on October 20th, which is like 20-something days away. All right, that's coming up. Uh, what else do I want to tell you today? Oh, Josh Lund is in the house. Yes. Yes, you will see him shortly, and you will hear him, and you're going to learn a lot about him today. But I want you to know about a couple things. Uh, after the service, we're also having a Q&A with this guy. You can ask him every important question you need to know about our highly vetted worship candidate uh, for this director position. Uh, what's your favorite Star Wars character, or what's your favorite fantasy team pick? I don't know, whatever you got for him go to the community center, which is at the end of the hallway upstairs, and talk to him about those things. And I uh, also want you to know the following week, next Sunday, October 6th, uh, members, we're going to vote on this guy. Um, and we're going to, um, that's a congregational meeting for everybody, and uh, we want you to be there. Uh, if you're part of the congregation, you're like, wait, why do only members get to vote? What's that about? What's membership? If you don't know, fill out a Connect card. Mark, hey, I'm interested in membership. And we will follow up with you and tell you all about it. Um, following that congregational meeting right after, we're also going to have a town hall, which is for everybody also. And we're going to share, the council and the finance team is going to share with you a, a special what is it called? Pastoral Housing Initiative. Uh, so important stuff there as well. All right. Whew. Uh, finance team. I mentioned that. I mentioned the word finance. Does anybody know what big financial event is happening tomorrow, Monday? 
Oh, yes, someone on the council does. Uh, it is the end of Hillside's fiscal budget year. I know it's a weird time to do it, but that's the way we do it here. And so the end of our fiscal year is coming up and uh, we have a budget put together that we are gonna propose to y'all. And we're excited about that. We're going to send that out, um, I think just soon, let's just say within a week or so. And um, one of the things that's very important is that we finish this giving year strong because that impacts uh, the, the approval of this budget. So this is our ask of you. Please spend a little time with the Lord, either today or tomorrow, before midnight tomorrow, the end of our fiscal year. Look at your giving statement. We sent out giving statements at the end of August and prayerfully ask the Lord, have I met the target that you've called me to give this year? Everything I have is yours, Lord. It comes from you. Um, have I met that target? It's between you and the Lord. If the Lord stirs you to give um, to help us finish this year strong, then do that and do it before midnight tomorrow. All right, you can, you can do it online. You can bring the, the stuff here. You can use the offering uh, box, which is in the back. Um, if you don't know what to do, just let us know and we'll help you out. Okay, let me pray for the offering while we're on that topic. Lord, we thank you uh, that you are the giver of great gifts. You are a generous God. You have been generous to us. You have lavished us with your grace and your kindness, God. And you are at work by your spirit making us a generous people as well. God. Um, so help us trust you in this. Help us seek you. Help us just follow your lead in this. Um, we want to be investing in your eternal kingdom, which is the only thing that lasts when everything is shaken. Amen. All right, we're going to end on a sweet note, uh, a trunk or treat note. Yes. Yeah, so on October 26th, the end of this month, we're doing something called trunk or treat. Now I grew up, we didn't have trunk or treat. And when I heard trunk or treat. I'm like, well, what do they do? Do they throw you in a trunk or offer you a treat? I didn't understand it. But we lived in Washington, you know, about 15 years ago, and we went to a trunk or treat thing. And it's super fun. People decorate their cars. They have uh, candy and they hand it out. And kids come in costumes and they check it out. And sometimes there's games. We're going to do that right here in the parking lot this year. We did it last year and many other years, apparently. But I just saw some pictures from last year, and it looks super fun. So my ask for you today is to consider decorating a car. Becky and I are going to do it for the first time. We're pretty fired up. Me more than her, but we're pretty fired up. And uh, there's going to be games, there's going to be food, and it's going to be a great event. And we want to have um, just a great outreach opportunity to invite our neighbors up here and to enjoy a good, safe, wholesome fun Halloween. All right. Uh, I think that's it. Let's do a mixer. This is an opportunity for us to meet each other, get to know somebody you didn't come with. And here's the plan. Uh, everybody's going to stand up, find somebody you didn't come with or you don't know or uh, you, know, you haven't seen for a while. Exchange names and your answer to this question, name a figure from history that you admire or are interested in and explain why. Share why. All right, questions up there. Go ahead, get up, find somebody you didn't come with or don't know, and share your name in that. It is, uh, again, just like Wayne said, really, really wonderful to have you here. We're going to be doing more singing, but like Wayne said, it's coming at the end of the service. But first, a message. Josh, no, you're getting a message first. Maria Mord, you owe me coffee this week, <laughs> Anna. Recently, one of my boys uh, has been telling me about the British anti-slavery leader, uh, William Wilberforce, who he has been reading about and writing about in school. And it is hard to put into words the magnitude of this guy's achievement. Consider this. When William Wilberforce was born, 1759, basically everyone in the world accepted slavery as a given. And that, that 
50,000 human beings every single year were ripped from their families and chained together and thrown in the bottom of ships in hellish conditions and taken to the new world uh, to become slaves. And for basically everybody, that was just a fact of life. But after Wilberforce died, 1833, basically everyone in the world viewed slavery for what it is, a demonic evil. And as his biographer points out, Wilberforce's achievement wasn't just that he changed the law. William Wilberforce changed human consciousness with his life and his ministry. And after Wilberforce, of course, there were still pockets of slavery. But after his life, nobody defended it anymore and nobody rationalized it. And again, that is preeminently due to one guy. Wilberforce is a hero for the ages. So the question becomes, what made Wilberforce Wilberforce because he was not born standing up for the oppressed. In fact, I, I learned this. He was known to be quite a partier in college. That's true. Uh, <laughs> and who knew Cambridge was a party school? But there you have it. Well, that's the topic of this morning's message. What made Wilberforce Wilberforce? Now, before we get there, if you've been around Hillside this fall, you know we've been in a sermon series called The Deep, Journey to the Depths of the Hillside Mission. And in the series, we're doing exactly that. It's like we're, we're boarding uh, our own Triton 2 sub, and we're venturing down into the Mariana Trench of our Hillside Mission, because there is a lot below those 12 words. Every single one of them means something, and, and here's what they are. This is our reason for existence as a church. It's making mature and equipped disciples who share Christ and serve the world. And so far over the last eight weeks or so, we've been diving below the word mature. But let's just do a quick review here to make sure everybody's uh, with us. What's that first key word of the mission, mature, really mean? What do we mean by mature? And, and this week, uh, I got, got a little idea, okay? How about a quiz? Huh? Huh? Uh, who's with me? Okay, ushers lock the doors right now. One quiz question, okay? And like all good teachers, I do allow for retakes, okay? Close your Chromebooks and uh, let's get to it. One, one question. Okay, at Hillside, the word mature as in making mature and equipped disciples who share Christ and serve the world means this. What is it? A, does it mean morally upright? Does it mean B, Jesus-like in personhood? Does it mean C, spiritual, not religious? Or does mature mean seasoned but spry? <laughs> huh? Is that what we mean by mature? What's the right answer? Shout it out. B, B Jesus-like personhood. That's right. Jesus-like in personhood, in character. That's what we mean by mature. And we mean it because that's what the New Testament means by mature when it uses that word, and it does quite a few times. And you can see it in Ephesians 4.13, which is one of our anchor passages at Hillside. And it says that the goal of discipleship is to become mature. And then listen to how Paul defines what it means to become mature. Listen to this attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. That's what we're after here together at Hillside. But back to Wilberforce. What made him what he was? And there's a very simple answer to that question. It's right worship. Right worship is what made Wilberforce Wilberforce and that's your first fill-in. At least worship broadly defined. And this is really interesting. Wilberforce's world-changing life began after he began to worship rightly. 
when he turned from seeing himself as ultimate to seeing the loving God who made him and then died for him in his son on a cross as ultimate. When he made that switch, everything changed in Wilberforce's life and then the world changed soon after. Now, how it happened is a very interesting story. He's a young guy. He wins a seat in parliament and then he decides uh, to take a trip across Europe. And he wants a friend to go with him, so he invites an old family friend, this guy named Isaac Milner, this famous Cambridge scholar. And while they are over the Alps together in this carriage taking this trip, Wilberforce makes this snide comment about a Christian minister that they both know. And the comment is to the effect that this minister takes Christianity way too seriously, okay? Almost like, like Pastor Wayne. I mean, really <laughs> believing it. Really wanting everybody to believe it too. Well, Wilberforce's expectation is that Milner, uh, this brilliant Cambridge scholar, will join in the trolling, except he doesn't do it. And Milner's response is basically, I don't view this minister as a fool. And I don't believe that what this minister believes about ultimate reality and Jesus Christ is foolish. And this absolutely flabbergasts William Wilberforce. He can't believe Milner's response and he can't believe that anyone that smart could take Christian belief so seriously. But, but Milner, this brainiac Cambridge scholar, does take it seriously and he does take it as something real. And just so you know, uh, Milner really was brilliant. In fact, he would later go on to occupy the same chair at Cambridge as Isaac Newton. So this guy had a big brain. <laughs> well, this conversation launches Wilberforce into an exploration of Christianity, which eventually leads Wilberforce to do the last thing that he ever expected to do as a rich, privileged, powerful member of the ruling class for the first time in his life, taking the God revealed in Jesus Christ seriously and wrapping his entire life around him, his forgiveness, his friendship, his mission. In other words, right worship. And then everything changed. Now, why tell this story? Here's why. Three weeks ago, in this room, we had a message on freedom. And in that message, we talked about what God's word says happens when we human beings engage in wrong worship. And we learned that when, as human beings, this is true for all of us, unbelieving people, believing people. When we love any part of the creation more than the creator, which scripture calls idolatry, you know what we do? We hand over real power, power that God has given us to bless and benefit his world. We, we, we hand it over to real, meaning genuine, dark, spiritual forces that then use that power to enslave us. And that's why being a human being is so much harder than being a hamster or a hippo, okay? <laughs> Because animals don't have the choice of what to worship or even whether to worship, but as humans, we do. And as human beings, we are always worshiping something. There's always something in our own hearts that's ultimate. Well, the object of worship that we choose will determine our life. That's what your life will be, whatever you worship. I have a question for you. Who hears guilty pleasure is spooky space movies? Uh -oh. I, I didn't think it would be you, Joni Templeman, but anyway. Um, I will admit that is mine. Okay, that is my guilty pleasure. And I, I think it stems actually from my dad years ago planning to take my twin brother and me to see the movie Alien, 
Okay? Yes. My mom had the same reaction. <laughs> and she put the kibosh on it. I think maybe because we were five years old at the time. <laughs> But here's the point. Think of idolatry this way. Think of idolatry as opening the airlock, opening the hatch of our innermost selves to real alien forces that are out to ruin us. So the Bible says, that was three weeks ago. Today we get to talk about what happens when we do just the opposite when we joyfully, humbly worship the one we were made to worship, our maker as opposed to the things that he has made and what results from right worship. Looking, adoring, praising the God who made us, what results from that is not slavery, it's something entirely different. It's freedom and it's wonderful and you could put it this way, when we human beings worship the one true God, we devote our lives around the one true God who we know in the person of Jesus Christ, we recover our original shine. And that shine is a, a kind of power, again, a power that God gives us, that allows us to improve the world, that allows us to bless our environments and most importantly, a power that allows us to highlight the God of the Bible as the unsurpassed treasure of the world and the unsurpassed maker of this world. Scripture is plain about this. When we worship rightly, when, when, when we, we, we make God our supreme desire, you know what God does? He reglazes us with his own glory. And that's a glory that he created us with according to Psalm 8.5. Listen to this verse, 2 Corinthians 3.18. This is a key verse for the Hillside Mission. And this is a verse to underline in your work Bible. If you, you have a work Bible, one that over time you're annotating more and more and more, maybe as you're trying to become wise in the word, like we talked about two weeks ago. Listen to this verse. Paul writes, and we all with unveiled face, he's talking about us, he's talking about disciples, beholding the glory of the Lord, looking at Jesus, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another, for this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. Well, what's Paul saying? It's pretty transparent. He's saying when we behold Jesus, we become like him, little bit by little bit over time. Let me ask you a question. Who here has visited a medical facility for any reason recently? Last two or three weeks. Oh, interesting. Okay, several of us. Maybe getting treatment yourself. Maybe to visit a friend in the hospital. Maybe somebody in your home group. Maybe somebody in your Oasis small group. And we Hillsiders, by the way, and I mean this, we do this for each other at Hillside. When we are in the hospital, we visit each other. And we try to get there before even Pastor Jane does okay <laughs> especially the people in our, in our group in fact the fact that this is part of our culture that we don't forget about people who are in the hospital it almost makes me excited to think about my next stay in the hospital okay <laughs> because I it's true because I know that Jerome and Chelsea Napez are going to come and see me and they might just bring a mylar balloon okay <laughs> so but here's the thing, if you've been to Kaiser recently or John Muir or any hospital like that, you've likely been barraged with messages about wellness, messages about ways to seek holistic health. And this is a good thing, but here's the truth. Here's the real, public, hard-boiled, hardcore, real-world truth. Diet, exercise, mindfulness, they are valuable practices but right worship is the ultimate human wellness program. It's the ultimate one. It starts there. Setting our hearts supremely on God is what sets us on the path for genuine wellness. And guess what? That wellness is not just internal. It's not just intangible. It's not just spiritual. It's a wellness that extends to our physicality. Look at your notes. 
Listen to this. This is probably a verse that you may not have come upon very often. John prays, Beloved, I pray that all may go well with you and that you may be in good health as it goes well with your soul. Isn't that amazing? And if you're new, maybe you're here this morning, you're from the neighborhood and you've been wondering about all the cars coming up the hill every week. Sorry, we'll slow down. (laughs) Or maybe you're here because you were in the park last week or you were in the park over the course of the summer. Let, Let me say this to you. Maybe you're just beginning your exploration of Christianity. If that's you, we're so glad. We're so glad you're here. Hillside is a place for people to explore the faith in a totally no pressure environment. But would you consider if you're new and you're just getting going with your exploration that your comprehensive wellness your comprehensive wellness, your relational wellness, the way your relationships work, your, your, your professional wellness, the way you operate in the professional world, even your physical wellness to some, some degree, would you consider that it could be immeasurably enhanced by doing what William Wilberforce did and doing a worship 180, a worship flip, and redirecting your whole self to the God who made you and who loves you and wants nothing more than to have a deep relationship with you where you become what he imagined you would be. Somebody who is a blessing to the world, who enriches and beautifies and blesses the environment wherever you happen to go. Now let me ask this, is it clicking why worship is so central to Hillside? Is it clicking? I think it's clicking. It's clicking for me. It's clicking for you too, I think. (laughs) Maria, help me out. It's clicking, right? Okay. Why is worship so important? Worship is central to Hillside because worship is central to transformation. And our mission as a church is all about transformation. It's about becoming something. It's about believing in Jesus and being united to him and enjoying his forgiveness and being awarded the promise of eternal life in a new heavens, a new earth world and a perfect new body that will never disappoint us. It's all that. And then it's also step by step becoming like him from the inside out in real personhood and real skill. That's what our mission is about, becoming mature and equipped Christ sharers in the world, doing for the people around us, what Isaac Milner did for William Wilberforce and world servers. Now on the one hand, our whole lives as disciples are to be acts of worship, right? Everything about us is meant to bring glory to the God who made us. On the other hand, it's God's intention that disciples like us devote one part of the first day of every week to concentrated corporate worship, a concentrated corporate group form of that whole life response. It's God's intention that we devote a certain amount of time every single week to the worship service. And this has been something that's been true for Christians for 2,000 years. The early Christians viewed that concentrated corporate worship where we're all together and we cheer each other on. They viewed that weekly worship as absolutely fundamental to Christian transformation. They could not have imagined being a Christian without regularly being with his people in church. And so do we here at Hillside, which is why one of the big four habits of every disciple is the worship service, because it's a primary transformative event. And friends, this is also why we need the right worship director. You glad you got the message now, okay? (laughs) We need the right leader. We need the right leader to oversee this weekly gathering that God himself calls us to, like Wayne said. And we've been looking, and we have been praying, and all along we've known who we've wanted. We've had a template in mind. First of all, we've wanted a person who loves Jesus, non-negotiable. We want somebody who really is absolutely taken 
with the person of Jesus our Lord. Second, we've wanted a Jesus-like person, somebody who's made some progress in becoming mature in the sense that we've talked about it. Third, this has been huge. We have wanted a humble team player. Somebody who will fit with our humble team player staff and council. A staff that has no featured backs. <laughs> a staff in which everybody runs the ball and shoots. A staff of no prima donnas. That's not us. We wanted somebody who would fit into the team as an equal member. Fourth, we wanted somebody with a pastor's heart and identity. We didn't just want a musician. We wanted a, a pastor. Somebody who would understand this event as a transformative event and somebody who would care for us and maybe even occasionally show up in the hospital <laughs> with or without Mylar Balloon. And lastly, we've wanted a, a strong musician because as the Psalms make clear, uh, a lot of our praise and worship happens in the context of worship. Well, after seven months of praying and searching, our search team has found the person and he is Josh Lund. Yeah. <laughs> And there he is. And they've recommended him to me. And uh, they've done so with great enthusiasm. And I want to talk about the process and the people. Search team was led by Roy Wensley. And his team consisted of Gary Cedarwall, Randy Fishback, Sherry Nodder, Kemi Agan Bomero, Andy Wagner. Mark Boucher served as liaison to council. And first under Roy's superb and cheerful leadership. They first took the job description and they refined it. Then they posted it on uh, several job boards in the covenant, outside of the covenant. Then they had phone calls. They called uh, music professors at various Christian universities asking if they knew anyone who could be a good fit for Hillside. Then they reviewed 50 applicants. Then they did follow-ups with eight applicants. Then they performed interviews with four semifinalists. Then they performed additional interviews with two finalists. Roy Wensley even made a trip to Phoenix <laughs> on a 109 degree day, okay? <laughs> That's his love for you, Hillside. And the result of their work and their prayer and their careful thought and their intense conversations at different points was Josh Lund. And I wanna tell you, I could not be happier about their, their choice. I just could not be. So I presented him to council. I presented him to our staff. They're similarly enthused about this man. I, I'd had a connection to Josh in the past. I'd heard about him by reputation. I knew something about him even before we started the process. He had a reputation in the town we're both from, Davis, as being an uncommonly wonderful, Jesus-like person. Loves kids and really skilled at music. And that brings us to this moment right here. And this is the most important moment in the whole search. And here's why it is. Josh is already a licensed minister in the covenant, which is immeasurably great for us. And that means that you, the voting members of Hillside, will need to formally call Josh in order for us to hire him. You, you'll be embracing him and accepting him as one of your shepherds here, which I hope you'll do in the business meeting next week. And I hope you'll do it because I already love this guy. <laughs> and I want him to be our key partner in worship ministry. I have kept you in suspense long enough, haven't I? <laughs> Come on up, Josh. Okay. Uh, oh yeah, we, we, Wayne, do you have the, uh, the mic here? Yeah. <laughs> Josh, tell Hillside family a little bit about yourself. Yeah, so um, I grew up in Kingsburg, California, and um, I have a very unique background in ministry. My parents started a nonprofit youth ministry that ran out of our house growing up. So I got to be part of having church at my house all the time. It was a lot of fun. And it was very formative for me, and it inspired me to pursue a degree in Christian ministry and I minored in music at Fresno Pacific University. And while I was there, there was a camp fair, and they're like hiring people for summer camps, and I, f I found Mission Springs Frontier Ranch. <laughs> and nice. so 
every year in college, I worked at Frontier Ranch as a counselor or a team counselor, which is like a counselor for the counselors. And that was a lot of fun. And I really loved camp ministry, so I thought, hey, you know, I'm, I'm going to stay in this. After I finished school, there was an internship at Mission Springs. They used to have it. It was a two-year internship. And I got to do guest services throughout the year. I hosted Hillside Covenant when you guys came on retreats. And then I would recruit summer staff and kind of oversee them during the summer. And after that, I felt like God was calling me back into church ministry because the part that I loved so much about that was the connection and worship with people. And so I wanted to be a part of that. And I found an internship at Vintage Faith Church in Santa Cruz. And I did high school ministry. And halfway through the year, I got hired as like the kids ministry song guy. So that was a lot of fun. And uh, that kind of settled it for me that I love church ministry and I wanted to go into it full time. And there was a position at University Covenant in Davis uh, that was a junior high pastor position. And I applied for that and I've been there for five years. And I met my wife there. Um, and we've been, we we're going to be married at three years in November, wow. which is awesome. Wonderful. And we have a dog named Bowser and he's really funny. <laughs> I think he's actually in one of our cars in, in dog mode, the Tesla dog mode. Thing. So he's safe. He's good. He's, he's happy. How, how did you discover uh, that God had given you gifts for leading worship? Well, um, music's always been a big part of my life. Uh, when I was three, my parents told me a story that I would open the kitchen cabinets and pull out the pans and get some wooden spoons and pretend there was a drum set. So that, that's kind of always been part of me. And in junior high, it kind of changed. My, my dad bought me a drum set, and my parents really encouraged me to start playing. And I didn't really want to. I didn't know if I was going to be good at it. Um, but that summer, I went to a summer camp called Heartland Christian Camp. And they had this amazing worship. And I really connected with a drummer named Uriah. Yeah. And he let me play one of the songs on the stage. And I was very fresh at playing drums. So that was amazing. But he really discipled me, and he challenged me. He, he told me that I should read my Bible every day and pray every day and come back next year. And that solidified in me that I really loved worship. And every year I came back, um, I taught myself to play guitar and sing, and I would take things uh, that I learned at camp and bring it back to youth group. And so everywhere I've gone from that point on, worship I knew worship was going to be a big part of what I do, and it has been. Yeah. That's great. You're, you're only 30 years old, but you actually have a lot of ministry experience. Yeah. You've got significant experience at UCC, University mm -hmm. Covenant Church in Davis, one of our, our sister churches, and a vintage faith in Santa Cruz, which is a wonderful place. Yeah. Had mm -hmm. a lot of impact in a lot of churches all over the place for many years. So even though you're 30, you've got a lot of experience. What are some of the things you've learned as you've uh, reflect on your ministry experience? <clears throat> the thing that I've learned the most is how true Matthew 11 is. Mm. And Matthew 11, uh, Jesus is saying, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest and take upon my yoke because it is easy. My, my burden is light. And it's a weird thing to think about your work being rest. Mm. Um, and in ministry, it's easy to carry the weight of everything you're doing by yourself. And when you're doing that, it is so heavy and stressful. And I've learned how true it is that God wants to come alongside us. And he, he wants us to take on his yoke, hmm. but it is easy and it's restful. Hmm. An example of this is um, in youth ministry, we love to do fun events and take kids to trampoline parks or bowling. I always have to organize this carpool and RSVPs to make sure I have every spot for every kid and I know who's coming. And every single time on the day of, I get five kids that show up that I didn't know were coming. <laughs> And it's a logistical, stressful situation, but every time I've, I've had this sense of peace that God was going to provide. And for five years at UCC, every single event, we've always had just enough seats. Even this last summer, we had five kids show up, and I was like, okay, God, what are we going to do? And then a parent shows up with another kid that did not RSVP and says, hey, I can drive. Wow. Well, but there we go. It's great. So... <laughs> You know, I've learned that God really does come alongside yeah. us, and, and if we, when we trust him, he really does make it yeah. restful. Yeah. yeah, that's wonderful. Mm -hmm. uh, tell us a little bit about how you think about worship leading. Yeah, um, when I think about worship, I first think about Romans 12, yeah. which talks about how we are offering our lives as a living sacrifice for God. The way we live out our faith in our actions is worship to God, mm -hmm. and um, I think that's a huge part, kind of what you were saying earlier, 
that um, this is right worship, yeah. that we are praising God through our choices to live mm -hmm. as Christians. Um, but I also think a huge part of that is praise. Um, a huge yeah. part of living out a Christian life is praising mm -hmm. God. And I, you know, when we think about interactions in scripture, every time people interact with God, they cannot help but praise him. They fall down. Yeah. And they're, they're, they're almost terrified because it's so amazing. And the angels are singing. And if we don't praise, the rocks will cry out. So praise is such a huge part of worship. Mm -hmm. And I love that we come together as a church to praise God. Mm -hmm. And I love when we're praising him, we're not just singing songs that are Christian. We are singing songs that proclaim the worthiness of yes. God, mm -hmm. that he alone is worthy of our mm -hmm. praise. And I love that we do that. So each song that we pick today, mm -hmm. there's something specific that is calling yeah. out a worthiness element of why God is worthy. So uh, we have four songs that we're going to sing. How Great Thou Art is the first one. And this one really is about that encounter with God. Yeah. When we encounter God's greatness, his amazingness, we can't help but pray. So mm -hmm. that's one. Uh, we have Build My Life, which is about how God is a firm foundation that we can trust and build our life upon. And then there's Great Is Thy Faithfulness. I love that song yeah. because God has been faithful. He is faithful. He will be faithful. And we can meet God in each one of those stages where we know he's been faithful. We need him to be faithful now. We're, we're trusting that he will be. Um, and then the last song is Cornerstone, which mm. really kind of sums up this whole journey of worship that, you know, our hope is found in nothing less than yeah. Jesus' blood and righteousness. Yeah. I just love that line. Wow. And then he is Lord, Lord of all through the storm yeah. that he is there for us. So that's kind of how I think about it. That sounds wonderful. Will yeah. you lead us into God's presence? Yes. And I'll pray while mm -hmm. you set up. Yeah. Father, we just thank you for this morning. Thank you so much for the opportunity to meet Josh, who's already been a gift to us. It was a gift to our, our staff and certain council members last week as we engaged and ate together and talked. And Father, we, we want to be a church that is serious about worship because you, just like Josh said, you're worthy of it. You're deserving of our highest adoration and attention and appreciation. That's what we want to be. And we also know that worship is fundamental to becoming like your son, both in personhood and skill. And so we want to magnify you for that reason because we want to become more and more of what you imagined we would be from the beginning, those who would reflect your goodness and glory into creation. So Father, we uh, thank you. And we pray that this time that we're going into right now would be nothing other than a time for us to connect deeply with you, to magnify you, to encourage each other as we sing out to you. And we pray that your heart would be blessed, your heart uh, would be touched by our worshipful, musical attention. Because you're the audience today. You're the one we're seeking to please. We love you and we're looking forward to this time in your presence. And we pray in Christ's name, amen. Um, as we sing these next songs, I just wanted to invite us into this space of really thinking about the words we're singing. You know, what are things that we are proclaiming that God, that are reasons why God is worthy of our praise? And you could be, you know, picturing in two ways. You could be singing these lyrics as a pro proclamation of victory, that you've seen God do these things. And you could also be singing them as a prayer, that you would like God to do these things. So I would like you to think about that as we sing these songs. Um, and also, there's, these are four songs in a row. This is a lot more than we normally do. So if at any time you feel the need to sit down, you're more than welcome to do that. So um, as you are able, would you please stand and join us in worshiping our amazing God?
my soul. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to me. How great Thou art! How great Thou art! Then sings my soul, my Savior God to me. How great Thou.
thy compassion they fail not as thou hast been thou forever will be oh great is thy faithfulness great is thy faithfulness morning by morning new mercies Trust the 
sweetest frame. But holy trust in Jesus' name. Christ alone. Oh, Christ alone. Cornerstone. Weak made strong in the same. That is so true. Through the storm, whatever that storm is, you are Lord, Lord of all. We thank you for your faithfulness, Jesus. We thank you for being faithful even when we have been faithless, God. Thank you for being our rock. Thank you for calling us out of darkness and out of that that chaotic sea of life without you onto your rock, uh, onto this cornerstone. We thank you for what you are building. We thank you for what you have planned here, Lord God. We thank you for your faithfulness in the past, Lord God. I'm just, as I was thinking about Josh and his wife, Sierra, here, I was just thinking about the great cloud of witnesses that stands behind them and then stands behind this church that extends back <laughs> way back even to Abraham, Lord God. We thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for that line of faith that has reached out to us uh, through our families here, through Josh's family, through Sierra's family, to bring them to this spot, Lord God. We thank you for your faithfulness to this church, Lord God, to bring us to this holy moment. We thank you for your loving presence, God. Man, and we're excited. We're excited as we... Uh, keep our eyes fixed on you and look ahead to what you have. Lord, we ask your blessing on this church. We ask for your blessing on Josh and Sierra, Lord God. We thank you for them. Boy, there's more to say, but I'm going to say amen. amen. All right. <laughs> Sierra, everyone. Yes. Good, Good job, brother. Yes. 
All right, you're going to be able to hang out with them a little bit uh, in the community center, which is way down the hall there. Uh, so go to that. But first, get some prayer up here. And uh, don't forget that informational meeting if you're going to the Dominican Republic. And have a great week. All right, that's it.